Uh, I'm just gonna do a really quick mic check, make sure everything's working okay. Can people hear me? Can people see me? Hopefully, yes, yes. Gonna wait for the chat to catch up. Great, awesome, cool, the scenes are working. Good to know, I didn't mess everything up. Okay, so uh, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to do this stream. Let's just crank this puppy out. Uh, some announcements right off the top of the bat before we get started. The next lecture is tomorrow, Tuesday, July 14th at 5 p.m. Central on Twitch, you know where to find me. Um, and after this five-part series, which ends on this Friday, I believe that's the 17th, Professor Chong's will air every other Saturday at 3 p.m. Central on the weekends that our main campaign does not stream. So that's easy to think about. Um, if you want to donate for some reason, if you want to follow, if you're not following already, go ahead. You know, like every contribution to follow is loved and very deeply appreciated, but there's no pressure whatsoever. Let's just have a good time talking. Uh, without further ado, let's hop right into it. So, Andake understood. What is that all about? Um, this series is meant to familiarize those who are curious about the homebrew world of Andake, which is this obviously original setting that the main campaign of Transplanar RPG is set in. Um, during this entire, you know, five-day process, I'll be discussing my approach to world building and the various ways that I've adjusted canon mechanics to work for Transplanar in addition to what the world itself is like. Uh, let's talk about the subject of today's lecture, which is envisioning a non-colonial anti-Orientalist world. Um, this is what I'm going to cover today. Uh, first of all, why I think it's important to build a world that is non-colonial and anti-Orientalist in the first place, i.e. why you should care. Uh, two, what I think D&D 5th edition lacks in this regard. You know, like what it does poorly. Um, three, how we as world builders, creators, GMs, and players can improve upon this blueprint. Excuse me, my armpit itches. Ba, 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 ba. And four, what I'm currently doing with my own campaign, Transplaner, to execute my vision of a non-colonial, anti-Orientalist world. Um, in terms of running the game, I know on my Tumblr I said that uh, Professor Chong's lecture series is going to be, you know, about GM tips, like how to balance encounters, do combat, you know, like homebrew items and stuff like that. Um, there's not going to be any, like, hard tips or like insights for this particular series. It's more about familiarizing you with the world. If you're mo if you're just here for like hard tips and content, you can check back in uh, for the first to normal Professor Chong's lecture, which is going to be Saturday, August 1st. Thank you for following. Uh, Saturday, August 1st at 3 p.m. CDT. But even if you're, you know, just here for that, I recommend that you stay. Uh, you might get something out of this. I don't know, you know, just have it on in the background as you cook or, you know, do something else or just watch it, do what you want with this stream. Uh, let's get right into it. So. Uh, I think the first thing that should happen is I should define my terms, right? Because we should all be on the same page about what non-colonial and anti-orientalist means. That makes sense. Um, this shirt is really itchy. <laughs> uh, so let's start with non-colonial. Uh, in order to understand what non-colonial means, we first have to have a common understanding of what colonial means. Makes sense, right? Uh, so colonial in the most basic, like, dictionary, uh, Wikipedia definition terms, uh, means the occupation of one country by another with the intent to populate the occupied country with the occupier country's citizens, right? That's like the most basic bare bones definition of, of what a colonial enterprise is, right? So examples in history, the 13 British colonies, right, of the United States in like what, the 17th century, and the uh, British colonial projects in India from the 17th, I think, until the 20th century, ending with the partition of India, right? These are just like examples from history. Um, so how does colonial translate when we're talking about D&D? Like, why is that relevant? Like, who's going out there like colonizing countries? This is a fantasy setting, right? So hold on. Here's the relevance. Um, a colonial list fantasy setting, right, means a setting where the relationship between fantasy and empire, right, is, unex is, is unexamined and normative, right? So like a colonialist attitude toward fantasy conflict would be something like, let's just go in and like kill all the orcs, right? They're the bad guys, who gives a shit? We just hack and slash and we loot their dead bodies, right? Or we're adventurers hired by this big company or hired by a wealthy person to wander into uncharted, uncivilized wilderness and kill monsters, get loot, and come back and fuck girls, right? Like that's another really colonialist attitude toward tabletop gaming. And these attitudes are what, you know, uh, I think I and a lot of other people who have played or GM'd have probably experienced at one point or another. We've probably been the adventurer slaying goblins just, you know, just to slay them, right? Or killing orcs without really thinking about it. Um, and this, this suggests a very normative attitude toward fantasy that we uh, play and inhabit in our own uh, tabletop, you know, home games or even podcasts and live streams. Um, 
So I think that not only is this kind of, oh, thank you for hosting. Uh, I think that not only is this kind of play loop, right? Get in, kill, get XP, get loot, get out, right? And then rinse, repeat, you know, do it over and over again. No, not only is this kind of play loop, ah, like unimaginative, right? Uh, after a while and maybe kind of boring, I, I think it's kind of harmful. Um, you know, like what kinds of stories are we telling here, right? Like what does it mean for a place in the world to be quote unquote uncivilized or quote unquote uncharted, right? I mean, British colonizers thought the United States was uncivilized and uncharted, the United States. I'm using the colonizer's term for 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 America, right? Um, you know, and this this kind of colonialist attitude justifies, you know, the genocide of indigenous peoples and continues to justify their oppression to this day. Um, so then if that's what a colonialist attitude toward gaming, right, and fantasy settings is, what what then is a non colonialist attitude, right? A non colonialist world in that case would be a world where hack and slash kill them all, you know, conquer the infidels, you know, that sort of attitude toward conflict is not, is not the default, is not the normative approach to problem solving, right? A colonial approach then, uh, sorry, a non-colonial approach then explores alternatives to handling problems and alternative ways of imagining problems in the first place that aren't based on diametrically opposed groups drawn along racial and or ethnic lines, right? Uh, so in Endake, non-colonial uh, is sort of, means two things. It means this, the non-normative approach to solving problems, and also it means that Andake, in a very literal way, has never been, is not, and will never be colonized. There is no, you know, no nations here are literally or figuratively colonizing the other, right? All nations in Andake, as you can tell in the map over here, um, have relatively equal amounts of power, let's say, and the conflict between them then refuses to cast one side as the definitive bad guy, right? There's no like evil orc empire you know, like for you to kill. There's no like one orc bad guy, you kill him, you know, and you're the heroes and that's it, right? Um, and I think that I'm probably not alone in this desire. I think there are a lot of GMs out there who are interested in having a more gray, you know, politically complex approach to conflict, right, in the first place. And just thinking about your world in non-colonial terms, I think is a great way to start, you know, doing that work. Um, you know, there's just people in conflict with each other. There's no definitive bad guy, right? People vying for power. And I think that's a lot more accurate, right? More authentic, right? Uh, and it's just more interesting, in my opinion, to explore. Uh, so let's move on to the term anti-Orientalist. Uh, and to define anti-Orientalist, blah, blah, what? To define anti-Orientalist, uh, we have to define Orientalist or Orientalism in the first place. Uh, so, Orientalism is a term coined in the 1978 book of the same name by Edward Said. Um, and this is my, my uh, interpretation of his definition, right? Orientalism is the fetishized construction of an Orient through which the West creates an understanding of itself as a superior and civilized culture, right? So Orientalism is essentially the creation of a global other. Uh, through the lens of the West. You see this in uh, Indiana Jones, right? In the mystical sacredness of Spielberg's uh, construction of the Middle East, right? In Raiders of the Lost Ark, that there was an Ark that was lost in the first place. Lost to whom, right? Um, you also see this in photojournalism, uh, where majority white pho photographers will snap pictures of the poor, impoverished third world child. Like, what kind of what kind of uh, narrative does this construct about the world, right? One where white people know more, right, about the other's issues than the other knows about themselves, right? Uh, you also see this very prominently in uh, Memoirs of a Geisha. If you don't know what that is, that is a laughably inaccurate and just false account of like a Kyoto Geisha's life written by this uh, white dude, Arthur Golden, I think he's British, don't quote me on that, I'll look that up later. Um, he made millions of dollars off of this misrepresented and just straight up false retelling of this one woman, her name is Miniko Iwasaki, her life. And she has actually come out and said, yeah, this dude took what I said to him in confidence, made money off of it, not a single cent went to me, and he also lied. He lied about my life, this is straight up wrong. She has her own biography out, uh, and y'all should look it up, it's really fascinating. Um, so then, what is an anti-Orientalist world, right, when we think about this definition? Um, an anti-Orientalist world, then, is one that rejects normative narratives about non-Western countries, cultures, and histories. 
Simple as that. So when we put non-colonial and anti-orientalist in the same sentence, phrase, descriptor together, right, what does this mean? Uh, this means envisioning a world where we embrace alternative ways of imagining conflict, right? That's the non-colonial side. And in the process, we champion non-normative methods of portraying cultures that do not belong to us. That's anti-orientalist, right? Uh, and I want to really emphasize that this whole thing is a process. It's a journey. It is never a destination. You will never build a world that is just, boom, the work is done. We're not racist. Everyone fucks up. That's normal, right? That's a normative kind of conflict. Um, and I think it's important to be humble and to realize that. And I, of course, am not an exception either. Like uh, a lot of these cultures, as we're gonna, maps over here, as we're gonna dive in and explore later, uh, they don't belong to me, right? Um, you could even argue, for example, Tiu Long, which is, which is fantasy China in a lot of ways. Even Tiu Long doesn't belong to me because I am not China. <laughs> I am not like the China, you know, like just like how no Indian person is the India and no like white person is the white, right? Like we all have our own unique perspectives, uh, attitudes, biases, you know, and baggage that we bring to any conversation. And that can be mined, right? For creativity and inspiration, but I think it should also be honored. Um, one last thing before I move on, is we used to describe this world as decolonized, right? And a big reason why we're moving away from decolonized is actually, I've read a really interesting Twitter thread about how uh, decolonized as a word has been misappropriated in a lot of like well-meaning, right, contexts. Like we say, oh, let's, de let's decolonize our minds, right? Let's decolonize, you know, the school system. But like, that sort of draws attention away from what decolonize actually means, which is returning indigenous people's lands, money, and lives to them. And I, you know, we, you know, at Transplaner, we had like a really uh, intense and interesting uh, production meeting conversation about this. Like, are we actually doing the work where, you know, is our live stream actually, deco you know, is it actually decolonizing anything? And we decided that's not a very accurate way to describe our live stream, which is why we're using non-colonial instead. Uh, so moving on. Glad I have my water over here. I'm gonna take a quick water break. I feel like I'm rapping. Uh, so moving on, uh, we're going to now more <laughs> intently, intensely, let's say, uh, focus on Eurocentrism and racism in fantasy tabletop gaming. Uh, so what does it mean, right, to build a fantasy world where the Western European imaginary, let's say, is not the foundation of creation? Um, and what I mean, right, by the Western European imaginary is like token-esque elves, dwarves, orcs, right? Like I mentioned before, races that are diametrically opposed and biologically or divinely, right, determined. Like the gods, you know, like in, I think in token, like orcs are just like evil elves, right? And they were like made by like an evil god. I actually, I haven't read too many of his works, so I might be misrepresenting it, but it's like not only divinely, but like biologically determined, right? Um, so what I mean by biologically determined is you are born with a certain set of immutable traits, right? So if, we're, if we look at the player's handbook, 5th edition, right? Uh, orcs are inherently brutish, primitive, and savage. That's like, I'm not even like, like pulling this out of my ass. I'm pretty sure it like literally says that like word for word. Um, they have like a minus two intelligence ability score increase, decrease. If you decide to play like an, like an orc character, you like can't change that. It's like illegal to homebrew that out of Adventurers League, right? And you know, historically and even now, I would argue and a lot of people, you know, would argue that orcs and other inherently evil races like goblinoids, you know, in general are often used as stand-ins, right? For black people. Asian people, you know, disabled people, Jewish people, etc. Uh, which is why their portrayal, I think, is really troubled and fraught and deserves a close examination. Um, a common rebuttal I hear to this argument is that, well, you're the real racist here. If you think of black, Asian, Jewish, disabled, etc. people, when you look at orcs, I don't think of that. I'm, oh, I don't see race. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a really fucking weak argument for several reasons, uh, because it completely ignores the context of like literally everything. Um, it's like the, the sketch by Key and Peele, uh, country music, right? And you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to play it right now. Uh, let me know if you guys can't hear this, but I think this sketch really encapsulates why that argument is whack. So let's, let's roll it. Hey, all I know is it's good having another brother move into the neighborhood. Hey man, it's good to have you over. And I think that you will dig this. All right. A content warning hey, for uh, racist acts against nice black guitar people collection. being described. Oh, thanks, man. Hey, you want to hear something? Like a lynching being described. Yeah, sure. All right. All right, let's get this oh, twist. Hold on, let's twist. 
Well, I'm just a good old American boy with a heart that's red, white, and true. Dreaming of the girl with the red hair and freckles in her eyes like the skies of blue. Okay, okay. It's music. Yeah, I grew up in Texas, you know, so. All right. So, so far, Keep so good. Keep her safe from the homies in the wrong side of town where they're smoking the reefer and acting like clowns. Keep that pretty white dress from getting dirty and brown because that's the American way. Woo! <laughs> oh. Pretty racist song. <laughs> <laughs> racist against who? That's literally black what you sound like when you use that people, argument. But I'm black. <laughs> well, keeping the red-headed girl away from the homies on the wrong side of town. Homies? Come on, brother. There's all kinds of homies. You know, There's all kinds of homies, orcs. Asian homies. White orcs, Asian orcs. No, homies are black. No, I think you're making them black, man. I mean, that, I think that's your stuff. You hear the twang, and then you assume that it's racist. But that's that's just what country music is like. Here, look, you're, that's you're just like what D and D is like. like. All right. Orcs are just savage. Some folks wear their hats way off to the side with their pants down low and a gun tucked inside. Take their beer by the forty and their chicken deep fried. I think we all know who we're talking about. The only dark Fucking I weak. like is when I turn off the lights. The only hood I love is pointy and white. Can't trust you if I can't see your face at night. I think we all know who we're talking about. Wait, wait, hey, stop that. That's racist. What's what? What is racist about it? The only hood I love is pointy and white. Yeah, man. The only elves I know plan, are white man. and thin. The Ku Klux Klan? Are you outside of your mind? That's traditional country music imagery, man. Like a, a pickup truck or sleeping under the stars or your dog got killed or your wife left you. Same thing. I would have been fine with any of those things. What is the difference between those things and what is in the song? They're not racial. Hey, you know what? Can I just say something, man? I'm just going to be frank. You're getting a little like Al Sharpton, like um, Farrakhan on me right now, man. Oh, I my think God. Like, oh, Are you serious? You know, dude, dude, please. Hey, give me, you know, can I do one more? Let me just do one more, dog. I absolutely promise you that this song is not racist and it's impossible it's a for you to misinterpret it. It's a constant warning here for a description of the Okay, it seems like you're about to sing the most racist song so far. I'm not. Hide it, hide it, hide it, get me a rope and find me a tree. Okay, I'm out. Come on, man. Here trying to sing about a tire swing. Light off an entire genre of music. The banjos are strumming and the drums are a banging. Let's get the boys together and have ourselves a hanging. Oh, damn. Now I see it. Now I see it. <laughs> Yeah, Key and Peele's great. Uh, so my question to y'all, you know, folks who are maybe on the fence or like not so convinced, uh, when are you gonna fucking see it? You know, everyone else does. When the fuck are you gonna see it? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Okay, Connie, calm down. Uh, so to sort of back up this assertion with like text, right? Uh, I'm gonna, let's, let's have like a little, little lecture here and uh, read this quote from Volos. Uh, savage and fearless, orc tribes are ever in search of elves, dwarves, and humans to destroy. Motivated by their hatred of the civilized races of the world and their need to satisfy the demands of their deities, right? Like what I said earlier about divinely determined, right? The orcs know that if they fight well and bring glory to their tribe, Groomsh will call them home. That's from page 82 of Volos. Uh, before I, I dissect that a little, let's, let's read another quote from Volos. Uh, this is from page 120. Uh, orcs are vicious raiders who believe that the world should be theirs. And to that I say, projection much. <laughs> uh, the chief conceit, right, of Orientalism is the creation of this imaginary other, right, on which whiteness projects its own fears, its own lack of self-worth, its own degradation. Uh, like the ones who are raping, raiding, murdering, genociding, exploiting, torturing, bombing, kidnapping. It's not fucking orcs, dude. It's fucking you. Get your shit together. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this, <laughs> this is why I think transplanter, are going, going back, going back to the world, right? Uh, this is why I think transplanter RPG and our homebrew world of Andake is important. 
um, at least to me, you know, at least to my players. And that's why I think it's important to think about these things. At least just think about it, you know? Like, if you're a GM and this is your first time being exposed to these concepts, just, like, just think about it. Read about it. Have this lecture not be the, the only place that you start interacting with concepts of race and fantasy uh, gaming. Not Have this be a jumping off point for you, but not where it ends. Um, so let's, let's, move, let's move into D&D mechanics. Uh, so, as we all know, if, if you play D&D 5th edition, uh, I'm not going to assume everyone's experience level here when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons. Part of the character creation process, right, is you, you pick a race, and you pick a class, and you roll some dice, or you use point by system to like build to build your character, build their stats, see what they're good at, see what they're bad at, build up their features, you know, like to plug some stuff in here, customize your character, and boom, you're ready to play, you're ready to roll some dice. Uh, so a big controversy, let's say a big uh, issue that's been floating around Twitter is, well, race in D and D kind of sucks, uh, both like socially from a socially critical lens, right? But also from like a mechanical lens, it really limits the kinds of characters you can make. If you want like Adventurers League legal, right? If you want to play an orc wizard, your orc wizard will never be as good as like a normal like human or like elf wizard uh, because of that minus two to your intelligence score that you cannot change unless you homebrew it, which again is not legal in Adventurers League. Um, so in Transplaner, how we're tackling this is your race that you choose in the beginning does not inform your ASIs, which is uh, shorthand for ability score increases uh, during the character creation process. Instead, your ASIs are determined by your country of origin, which is our attempt to emphasize nurture over nature, right? If you look at this, this map, uh, you can see the dotted orange lines are uh, different countries. Uh, so certain countries in Indake have certain values and ability score increases are tied to those values. So it's like if you're if you're brought up in a country that values physical strength, you know, and intelligence, then your strength and intelligence score will go up instead of, oh, I'm an orc. I guess I'm dumb, you know, which is also really ableist. Uh, so in addition to using this new way of determining ability score increases in Transplaner, Instead of choosing, you know, uh, racial features just based on race, uh, we use a system built by this guy called James Introcaso, thank you James, uh, of the World Builder blog called Customizing D&D Races. I think if you just look up his name, James Introcaso, on Google, customizing D&D races, it should be the first result that pops up. I'll also try to put a link in the in the uh, uh, chat later. Um, but it's basically actually a very super fun system where you use a point buy uh, mechanic to buy racial traits that aren't tied down to any one race. So what does this look like? You could have a dwarf that has wings like Aarakocra and has a fly speed. Uh, you can be a human with acid breath. You can be an elf with stone cunning. You could, you know, uh, be a tabaxi with the lucky trait, whatever, you know, like it's completely up to you. Your imagination is literally the limit here. And this also opens up, uh, you know, your character to have mechanical, you know, effects added to your background. Let's say you want to be a human with acid breath. Let's say you grew up in a swamp and you watched toads throw up acid, like big, you know, monster magic toads, and you learn from them how to throw up acid, and you can actually breathe acid. That's fucking dope, right? You can have mechanics reflect your background story choices. Um, you know, not only does the system sort of mitigate the issue of bioessentialism in gaming, it also, you know, very supremely opens up more choices for play and fun. So, that's how we've been trying to mitigate this issue in the character creation process. Uh, in terms of me, my work that I've done as a GM in building Endake, uh, I specifically wanted this world to not be situated in whiteness, westernness, or, you know, Western Europeanness. Uh, so yeah, let's see, let's get into talking about, uh, Endake, but first, another water break. Oh, an Easter, an Easter egg. Uh, that is in is in the title and Dake. I will say no more except for the fact that it is an Easter egg. Uh, okay, so each uh, each country uh, there are eight. Okay, let me start from the beginning. There are eight powers in Endake. Just gonna name them from. You can sort of follow along in the map. There is the commune of Moros to the to the very top on that frozen lake. That's that's a lake. That was my attempt of drawing a lake. Uh, there is the court of ravens, sort of off to the to the left, I guess that would be the the west, the east, east. What's the? Someone help me here. Is the court to the to the east or the left? What? The, that's the. 
Oh, uh, I'm just gonna say left for now. Uh, the courts, <laughs> the Court of Ravens is to the left. We go down, you see the Republic of Talmud to the top left, and to the right of Talmud are the clans of Kirtal. Moving southward, I know where south and north are at least, uh, we have the Championship of Nabal, that's where that heart-shaped lake is. Next to the Championship of Nabal, thank you for following, uh, is the Kingdom of Tulong, and to the right of the Kingdom of Tulong, that like long strip, is, are the United Tribes of Jukai. And to the far south, uh, is the kingdom of Wuhanahi. So each power in Endake venerates a different god in the eight, which is the name of the pantheon that's shared across the entire continent, the mainland and Wuhanahi. Uh, and you'll also notice based on my verbal description that each power has a different kind of government, right? Interesting, interesting. So two of them, Tulong and Wuhanahi are kingdoms, but one of them is a commune. Another is a clan, group of clans. Still another are the United Tribes, another is a Republic, another is a Championship, whatever the hell that means. Uh, and we'll find out late, more about that later this week. Uh, so in terms of the governmental system of Andake, I really wanted to explore variant ways of governing. I wanted to split away from the typical feudalist, you know, like European kingdom-esque royalty form of adjugating power and fantasy. Um, and even the kingdoms that do exist, right, aren't modeled off of Western European paradigms at all. Tulong is based off dynastic China, and Uhanahi is based off the kingdom of Hawaii. Um, You'll notice that I'm also being pretty, I want to be very open and transparent about my inspirations for each power. You know, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. Uh, in fact, I wish that more fantasy writers and fans were transparent instead of being like, oh, Westeros totally isn't fantasy Britain, even though it's called West Eros. Uh, as a sidebar, very quickly, I think it's really funny that it's the same people that jump to defend Game of Thrones, right? Being overly, overwhelmingly white, you know, except for, of course, the brown savage slavers, uh-huh, uh, because it's supposed to be fantasy Britain, right? And black people don't exist in Britain, you know, like, uh, but at the same time, it's the same people that are like, oh, this isn't about race or Europe or Britain. If you see that you're racist, like, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Sh fucking shut up. Um, just pick a flavor of races and stick with it. Uh, anyway, okay, uh, back to inspirations. Um, the United Tribes of Jukai, that strip with like the horse, horse-shaped horse lake, uh, is loosely modeled off of uh, medieval Japan. Uh, the commune of Moroz up north is, is basically fantasy Russia. Um, the Republic of Talmud is modeled off of a conglomeration uh, of medieval India and the Roman Republic. Sidebar, I know Rome is done to death, you know, in fantasy, but I was an old, I can't deny my classics nerd roots. I took Latin for like six years and was in like a high school Latin club. I had to pay homage to that in some way. Anyway, moving on. Uh, the clans of Kirtal are based off of, you know, the medieval confederations of tribes of Mongolia right before the formation of the Mongol Empire. Um, the Court of Ravens is loosely based off of fey courts, you know, in Western European imagination, um, in the sense that they're split into spring, summer, autumn, and fall courts. Uh, but that's kind of where the similarity ends. And finally, the Championship of Nabal is just, it, it's just like completely my own creation. Uh, there really is no intentional real world inspiration anywhere for that. Uh, but I'm specifically, the operative, the operative word here is intentional. I could definitely have subconsciously or unconsciously built in, you know, drawn inspiration from a particular culture or cultures for Nabal. Um, but the intention was not to have a specific inspiration. Uh, <sighs> so... In terms of race in the world and diversity, uh, fantasy races like orcs, half orcs, you know, Osimar, bugbears, tabaxi, loxodon, elves, etc. They do exist, yeah. Um, but one, you know, tieflings. Uh, but one is not specifically like it's not like a pretty typical way of approaching race where like tieflings are rare and like you know scored and you know you know outcast and like elves are hoity-toity and live in forests, you know, and like orcs are the you know the nomadic savages. It's not like that at all. Uh, I would say the races of Endake are spread pretty evenly across you know all eight. Uh, powers. Humans are not the majority. There are just as many elves, dwarves, loxodon as there are humans. Uh, everything's dispersed pretty evenly, and there are a lot of, you know, like half orcs, half whatevers, because uh, people can love, you know, love everyone. Uh, gay rights, right? Uh, people in Endake sort of 
identify themselves almost exclusively based off culture, you know, shared values, shared history uh, with each other instead of, I'm an orc, you're an elf, or oh, we hate each other, or, we're gonna fucking kill each other. Um, because, you know, uh, just thinking about this philosophically, what does that latter system say about us as storytellers, as historians, as writers, as creators, that different races are destined to hate each other? That's boring and bad, right? Uh, so I'm now going to take another water break. Mm. 30 minute mark. Great. We're almost at the end. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about my process of creation, right? My, you know, best practices I've picked up, my methodologies, you know, and I'm totally open to feedback about any of this and to collaboration, talking to other people who are interested in this kind of work. Uh, but this is, this is my approach. So when I am researching cultures that are often misrepresented in Western media to put in my own projects, you know, this live stream, my own books, whatever, uh, I think it's important to be thorough with my research and also humble with my research. Um, I can't know everything, um, but I can be conscientious about my approach to researching, right? You know, when I read an article about, let's say when I was researching for the cleanse of Kirtal, I tried to diversify my sources and content as much as I could. I read a lot about the history, you know, of like the Mongol Empire, you know, and the confederations and the tribes and whatnot. Um, but I also looked up a lot of like Mongolian cooking videos, you know, like from just Mongolian folk who are out here doing it, you know, like I, you know, look, I looked up for, you know, uh, the commune of Moroz when researching Russian history and folklore, I looked up, you know, like dance, like Russian traditional dance, you know, and I think it's important to have all different kinds of ways of looking at a particular culture that isn't just history in 1976, fuck it, you know, like that's, you can, that's important, you should know that, but it shouldn't be where you end. Um, because you're robbing yourself of a lot of really good, rich ethnographic research. I mean, you're robbing yourself of a variety of perspectives when you only look at the history of a, of a particular culture. Um, you know, and like I said earlier, I think it's also important to be open and receptive to feedback. You know, you can, and when I say you, it's like the royal you, I'm referring to myself as well. Um, you can and will fuck up. It's part of the process. I'm sure I fucked up already. Um, I am committed to learning what I can from my mistakes and not repeating them and not, and causing as little harm as I can. You know, that's, that's my, that's my primary goal is to not cause harm, right? Everything else, the creation, the imagination is secondary to, to not causing harm. Um, and yeah, I, it's something I've learned, you know, during this process is just be less, less focused on seeking objective truth about a culture because it doesn't exist. There is no objective truth. Uh, and focusing more on the mythologies, the folklore, the cultural practices, like I said, the dance, the food, the writing, the poetry, you know, that comes with it. Uh, because after all, we're imagining a fantasy world. We're not imagining a uh, fantasy history book, you know, like unless that's, that's interesting to you. It's not to me, but if it's interesting to you, it's your cat to skin. <laughs> Um, I also think when it comes to how does this translate into play, right? How does this translate to a session? Um, I think it's a lot more interesting and engaging to describe, you know, a location, a people, a conflict in terms of myth and fable than it is in terms of history and numbers. For example, I'm GMing a session. I say, you know, uh, the four of you stumble upon an outcropping of uh, depleted ore veins in the middle of a desert region. A uh, high perception check by the druid, let's say, reveals that one of the rocks in these depleted, you know, ore chunks uh, has unusually bright red veins of ruby ore running untouched down the middle, even though its brethren are completely harvested. This is interesting. Uh, and let's say the rogue obviously wants to mine it, wants to take the ore. Um, but upon approaching, the ranger notices various wreaths, you know, like oranges maybe, like offerings laid at the base of this ore and think something's up. So they ask for like a religion or a history check and they do well. And I, as the GM, I, I tell the tale um, of a god who, you know, bleeding from wounds inflicted by her mortal enemy, she, she took respite on this rock and and regained her strength and she thanked the rock by blessing it um, and the veins of ruby ore what remain of her blood right so leaving the ore untouched is seen as respecting the deity you know by the local villages uh, so th here comes the conflict does the party leave the ore alone or do they mine it for their own gain and that is you know this scenario you know in my humble onion uh, is instantly 
instantly more interesting to the players than if I had tried to engage them with like a rote recount, I don't know, of like geological deposits, you know, or like of the history of the area, you know. Um, I think it's important to ground stories, you know, and your research in myth, and this is why. Um, yeah, it's a fantasy world in the, at the end of the day, you know, let it be fucking weird. Like, let it be beautiful. Let it be terrifying and horrifying. Um, so another water break, and I'm actually going to check the chat right now as I take this water break because I have not checked it this entire time. I'm going to see if anything's happening. <laughs> Good luck trying to sell those rubies. Exactly. Exactly. Like, maybe you mined it and, you know, like a successful currency check, I don't know, uh, says that they're worth like a thousand gold pieces, but everyone thinks you're cursed now <laughs> and thinks you guys are evil. Like, good luck trying to sell it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ammo, for updating the automatic message. Were there any like questions that I missed in the chat? Like, ask them again, because I can only see the most recent stuff if you have any questions so far. Pointy bit sticking out in the top left. Northwest. Northwest, yes, yes, that's Northwest. The court is Northwest, thank you. Uh, no questions, okay, then I will continue. Uh, so I am now very quickly going to talk about other aspects of Endake that aren't inherently tied to race mm, intentionally. Again, everything can be subconscious. Uh, so I'm going to now open up on my little computer uh, this thing, this one sheet, this, uh, <laughs> It's more like 12 pages, 12 sheets. Uh, this uh, setting document that I think a lot of GMs share with their players, you know, before a campaign starts during session zero to like help spark, you know, inspiration, creativity. I'm gonna share aspects of this with, with y'all. So you all sort of have access to the same information that my players do when they're interacting with the world. I'm gonna burp. Good Lord. Oh, that was pretty tame. Oh, excuse me, there it was. Okay, uh, so. This one sheet, the over the broad strokes, which is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about specific powers for the rest of the week. Um, the broad strokes are split into three categories. The first one is what matters to Endakins. Like, this is also what's significantly different about the world of Endake from normal fantasy settings, specifically using, like, the Forgotten Realms or any other, like, D&D 5th edition or, you know, 3.5 edition uh, settings. Uh, the first one is what matters to Endakins. The second one is how magic works in this world. And the third one is lore, like lore that is common and shared across the world that everyone would know. Uh, so let's talk about the biggest chunk first, which is what matters to Endakins. Um, these are just the things that matter to all Endakins who live in Endake, regardless of, uh, you know, upbringing or background. Um, even those living in the most remote regions of the world or folks who eke out the most fringe of existences on the borders of the continent would, would know this stuff. Um, so the first one that if you've seen, you know, the first two episodes or even just popped in a little bit for either one of them, you would probably have picked up on this. Um, it's the stars. The stars in Andake are both useful and holy. Andake's night sky is famous in this world for being a second day due to the sheer number and brilliance of the stars. Uh, from birth, all children in Endake are taught to orient themselves and know themselves through the night sky. Sailors and travelers navigate almost exclusively through the stars, and in addition to their, you know, navigational significance, it's generally agreed upon that the beyond, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, exists somewhere above us in the stars, uh, and that the gods are most tangible in the nighttime when their nominal constellations appear. And uh, I'll get to that in a, in a moment too. Uh, and and Dakin celebrate many different holidays, festivals, holy days that venerate the stars. Because of this, mechanically, dark vision doesn't exist when it comes to playable races which are people, the people of Endake. No one has dark vision. Monsters might, you know, creatures might, but people don't um, because the stars are everywhere. Unless, and we, ha no one's, no, none of the, the PCs haven't run into any like mole people yet or like people living underground. Um, but those, those would, you know, logically be the only people who would probably have dark vision because they grew up to evolve to need it. Um, so when I say nominal constellations, I'll go, I'm going back to it now. Uh, what I mean is, remember the eight, right? The eight gods of Endake, which I'll cover in more depth later this week. Um, each one of them has a particular uh, constellation that is tied to them. For example, the constellation of Mahu, uh, who is the goddess of uh, volcanoes and ships 
and waves venerated by the people of Uhahi. Um, she appears in the night sky as like a woman with waves for hair, like in, in the constellation. Uh, and each constellation, each god, uh, each constellation is seen as the god. There's sort of no way of divorcing the two, which is why, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen episode one, plug your ears. Uh, and when I count down from five, you can unplug them. I'm going to wait for you to plug them now. Okay. I'm going to start, which is why when the stars disappear in the first episode, uh, it's such a big deal because people feel like the gods have disappeared too. They like, you can't separate the two. Um, in addition to this, the constellations of the gods are fixed in the night sky. They don't move like other stars do. Um, and because of this, the resting point is sort of what I call them of each constellation, each god in the sky is where civilizations have naturally cropped up underneath them. So if you look, if you look at the map and you see where each civilization is, that's sort of, that's roughly where each constellation is sort of like located as well. Um, there's also no moon. There is no moon in the, in, in the sky of Endake. It just doesn't exist. Um, people have asked, then how do the tides work? And my answer is magic. <laughs> uh, so moving on to the next part of what matters to Endakins. Um, the gods, obviously. So what's the relationship between the people and the gods? Because in some settings, you can talk, you can call up the gods, you know, you roll well enough and you say, yo, Bahamut, I need a favor, we're getting TPK. And Bahamut will be like, then flourish, you know, and allow it. Uh, but in Indake, it's a little different. The gods in Indake are remote and unaligned, but we curry their favor anyway. So unlike most settings, the gods of Indake do not possess inherent alignments. Baha you know, there's no Bahamut who's lawful good. There's no like chaotic evil Orcus, you know. Uh, everyone, every, you know, it's unaligned. For example, the Raven Queen is the one, the one canon 5th edition, uh, like for, you know, D&D &D god, god I'm using, but I'm like, sort of like making her my own. Uh, the Raven Queen isn't like lawful neutral, you know, or true neutral or lawful evil or anything. Um, instead, the gods can be considered, you know, like I mentioned, unaligned entities. They're kind of remote and unreachable. Uh, and because of this, mortal folk constantly seek to curry favor with their gods. And it's very common for conflicting and even like, contradicting interpretations of omens, you know, visions, philosophies of gods, dreams, and signs. It's extremely common in Endake. That being said, the eight major powers, you know, the court of ravens, the clans of Kirtal, the kingdom of Tulong, etc., uh, tend to worship and prioritize the good or at the very least neutral sides of their deity in hopes of inviting good things to pass. Um, and though there are those who venerate the evil sides of the gods, right? And they're sort of shunned from mainstream society. They, you know, they tend to splinter into cults that, that can threaten the edges and the underbellies of civilization here. Um, yeah, so there's no, you know, there's no, there's no good, good or evil god here, which, which was, was an intentional choice on my part. And I'm interested in seeing how this plays out. I am. Uh, so what do I mean by the gods are kind of remote and unreachable? Uh, what I mean by this is the gods don't talk to mortals, their emissaries do. So visions uh, given to people who are connected to the gods in some way almost never it's like unheard of for them to come directly from the deity they venerate. They can claim that it comes directly from the deity, but this is usually laughed at. Um, but rather these visions come from emissaries, right? That bridge the gap between the beyond and the now. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, these emissaries encompass any number of extra planar beings found in other D&D settings, like angels, demons, fey, elementals. This is where all that good stuff comes in, extra planar uh, beings, right? And unlike the gods that these beings claim to serve, most of these emissaries are inherently mortally aligned. For instance, demons tend to represent the evil side of their deities, right? And angels represent the good side of their deities. Um, and beings such as elementals and fae are probably more neutral or like chaotically or lawfully aligned. Um, and the last thing that all Indakins would know that I've talked about before, for the, like the first half of this, is that race-based conflict and distinctions are not a thing. Uh, like I mentioned, different races exist, but race, you know, bioessentialism, racism are not a thing. There aren't any stereotypes that orcs are brutish, 
and strong, you know, that elves are svelte and beautiful, and dwarves are bearded and live underground. You know, physical features are varied across all races. You know, you can have muscular elves, beardless dwarves, skinny orcs, etc. Um, and there's no inherent conflict between races, but we've talked about this for like ever, so let's move on. Um, the next part is, the next section uh, of, of the overview of this one sheet it discusses how magic works in Endake. So all magic, and this is where the now, the after and the beyond comes in, so just hang on tight if you're like, what the fuck does that mean? I'll get to that. Um, so all magic in Endake is embodied through the weave, which is a concept that is in 5th edition, but I'll extrapolate uh, on it a little bit more. Um, the weave is the very essence of magic all around us. Commoners in Indake are aware, theoretically, um, of the weave's existence. Oh, itchy, itchy. Um, but they are unable to tap into it or harness it for their own devices. The magically attuned often describe the weave as a force that registers beyond their bodily senses and can pull at its various threads to enforce their will upon the world. Um, and this lends to very cool, you know, world building opportunities, you know, like flavor opportunities. Like if someone dies, it feels like the weave snaps and goes limp around them. You know, if like an emissary pushes into like the now, it feels like these strings growing taut with their power, you know, all around you, especially if you're magically attuned. There's a lot of opportunity for like cool descriptive flavor uh, when it comes to the weave. Um, and in terms of the kinds of magic in Indake, I split them into two primary categories. There's divine magic and there's arcane magic. There's also natural magic, which is what druids, rangers, etc. tap into, but in Indake, for the, for the sake of simplicity, it's regarded as a subset of arcane magic. They're like pretty much in the same category. So how does divine magic works work? Uh, as the name suggests, divine magic is magic with divine origins. This is your clerics. You know, these are your clerics. These are your warlocks who get their power from an emissary that worships a god. You know, these are some paladins who cast spells using divine magic. Typically, divine magic is granted through a pact with a god's emissary, like through a warlock, or through the ardent worship of or belief in a god. Uh, the gods themselves are the only entities that can generate divine magic of their own. Even like emissaries get their power from gods. Thank you for the follow, um, which is proof that the gods exist, right? Cause it's, you know, gods exist. This is fantasy, they're real. Uh, so how does arcane magic work? The question of arcane magic is a little bit more complicated. Thank you for following Lycan Dragon. Um, simply put, arcane magic is the raw magic that powers Endake. It's found in nature. It's found in the ether, you know, it's found in bloodlines. It can be harnessed through a variety of methods outside of worshiping the gods. Wizards study and research arcane magic and learn to tap into the weave through a combination of incantations, gestures, material components, sorcerers and paladins who are powered by their dedication to an ideal instead of a deity can intuitively harness the weave without a lot of schooling. And bards are slutty. Uh, so what is the relationship between divine and arcane magic? The relationship between these two uh, in Endake is, is the subject of much study by various institutions across Endake. It is generally agreed upon that there is some kind of relationship between divine and arcane magic, but the details are hotly contested and highly controversial within thaumaturgical communities. Uh, a popular theory is that arcane magic is simply divine magic left over on Endake from when the gods used to roam the now many millions of years ago. In modern, uh, in a modern, uh, what's it called, comparison, arcane magic is the fossil fuels uh, to the god's dinosaur. Uh, <laughs> uh, so now we're getting into the question of the now, the after, and the beyond. These are the planes of existence. Instead of bothering with what, like, the, the Great Wheel cosmology, where there's, like, 19 different planes of existence, Gehenna, and they're all like aligned with, you know, an alignment. I'm scrapping all that. There are three. There is the now, the after, and the beyond. Mortals then rule the now, which is essentially the material plane. Um, the gods and their emissaries dwell in the beyond, but their domains extend into the after, which is where the souls of mortals go after death. So you die, your soul goes by, it yeets into the after, where it's looked over by emissaries and the gods from the beyond. Um, 
There's also, I, this isn't in the one sheet, so this might be new information for my players. There's also the ethereal plane, which is like the veil between the now and the after that I think like some like abilities allow, like plane, like plane shift or like step into the ethereal or whatever, allow you to access. So that's how, that's how I'm like describing it. It's like the, the veil between the now and the after. Finally, gonna move on to the final portion of the overview of Ndake, uh, which is lore, uh, the general lore of the world. I only, I only have one piece of lore in the lore category right now, which if you've seen episode one and or two or a snippet of either or both, you will probably have picked up on this as well, which is that dragons are extinct and giants. Dragons and giants are extinct. Before people, which is humanoids, right? Before people ruled Endake, the world belonged to giants and dragons. This is common knowledge. However, that age is far in the past, many dozens of thousands of years before the beginning of our campaign, and they're now considered extinct. They're like uh, dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 is that it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, when it comes to the overview of Endake, um, I am constantly updating this one sheet, 12 page sheet more like, uh, to reflect new knowledge that the the PCs might uncover about the world, right? Um, and I do my best to flag my players when they un uncover, you know, new knowledge about the world, or if I come up with something and I decide to put it in. Um, I think that this method of having a, excuse me, <clears throat> living document that both I and the players refer to um, takes the load off me, right? First of all, as a GM to establish everything about the world right off the bat. And it also allows me to improvise creative flourishes, you know, off the cuff without contradicting myself because I have a document I can reference. Oh boy. Next up is another water break. Great, a backstage Discord channel. We are collecting questions in chat. So it's easier for you to find. Um, should I, I guess I can take a look at that Discord channel now because pretty much all I have is my conclusion, my wrap up. Backstage, backstage, live questions. Okay, I'll answer the questions before I do my, well, I'll do my conclusion first. Yeah, I'll do my conclusion first. Uh, so in conclusion, all of this, we're gonna wrap up the, the stream now. It's been almost an hour, uh, which is perfect. Exactly what I wanted. Um, envisioning a non-colonial anti-orientalist world. What does this mean? A non-colonial world embraces alternative ways of envisioning conflict beyond killing and pillaging the constructed other and an anti-Orientalist world roots perspectives in cultures that are regularly misrepresented by the West and pushes back against these misrepresentations. But maybe most importantly, in my humble onion, a non-colonial anti-Orientalist world is one where myth-making is a process, right? Not a destination. Uh, a world that fully embraces the notion that there is no one way to tell a story. Thank you for listening to my chat. Uh, I will now answer some questions. Um, yeah, some questions that were received during the live stream uh, that is in this backstage Discord channel. Let's see, question number one from Mystery Cycle. How much research? I worry about, excuse me, I worry about misrepresenting a culture I'm not native to, especially if it's non-European. This is a good question, and I find myself grappling with it now and I probably will forever. And I think the first step to answering this question is realizing that there is no right answer. It's not like do eight hours of research per four categories that you're looking into. There's no, there's no hard and fast like way of looking at it. Um, I do as much research as I feel emotionally and you know, like creatively able to before I start the writing. And usually the research and the writing happen at the same time for me. So I'll use, um, I'll use, let's say, the United Tribes of Jukai as an example, roughly modeled off of, you know, f you know, uh, Japan, uh, medieval Japan. Uh, I did some. The first thing I did when researching Jukai was I looked up uh, the geography of Japan, because geography is probably the thing that changes the least over thousands of years, because it takes a while for the land itself to be shaped. So I looked up the geography of Japan and I'm like, okay, this is interesting. 
uh, what are like some things I want to pull from it? What are some things I want to set aside? What are some things I want to expand upon for myself? Um, and I'll talk about Jukai more thoroughly later in the week. Uh, but after coming up with some like setting, like like the physical, the physical like touch, taste, you know, smell, like aspects of Jukai, I started thinking about the culture, and that's when I really started deep delving into like um, the political relationships, you know, between feudal lords, you know, in Japan, you know, and their you know and their vassals, etc. And, you know, similar to how when I was researching Mongolian cuisine, I also looked up like ways of, you know, food, knowing food, knowing art, uh, knowing dance that helped uh, power my research. Um, and the good thing is, the so here's a here's maybe kind of a, a tip for those who are uh, overwhelmed with building a huge, uh, diverse world. Um, you can have the broad strokes of each, you know, country laid out first. Just be like, okay, there's some deserts here, some plains here. And you, you don't you don't have to go deep until your PCs get there. PCs close your, like if you're a player, close your ears. You really don't. Our PCs are starting out in Talmud, right? The Republic of Talmud, which is my uh, sort of love baby between uh, medieval India and uh, the Roman Republic. So I've been doing a lot of research into medieval India and the Roman Republic. And I've been doing a lot more research for that specific, you know, culture as opposed to, let's say, um, Russia right now because they're not fucking in Moroz. I could I could just leave that till later. <laughs> like I'm saving myself some work. Uh, so I would say pick and choose your battles depending on where your PCs are. Um, and just have enough until you, you feel like, okay, this this feels like I can see, smell, taste, touch, and hear the world before delving deeper into the culture, I think would be would be my would be my answer to that. Um, and it's okay if you, you know, it's okay if you feel like you're not prepared because you can never be completely prepared as a GM. Sometimes you just have to take the nose dive. Uh, next question, also by Mystery Cycle, thank you, uh, is if you're not writing like the standard RPG text style when presenting countries, how do you present the information to DMs in a way they can absorb and represent in their game? I'm gonna reread that because I'm not sure I quite understand this question. If you're not writing the standard RPG text style when presenting countries, how do you present the information to DMs in a way they can absorb and represent in their game. I'm assuming you're trying to create a setting document of your own game uh, or your own campaign that other people can play. Uh, I'm gonna assume that's the context of this question. Um, so this is actually a really good question uh, that I that was somewhat talked about on a Twitter thread earlier this week. I'm gonna see if I can link it in the chat later uh, or in the Discord at least. Um, but someone on Twitter, I think their name on Twitter is Kazumi Chin, uh, was talking about so if you're writing a setting document for your homebrew world or for like your homebrew monsters or NPCs, how do you present them in a way that isn't just like presenting them as fact, right? A standard RPG text stat block, right? Um, my answer would be lean, in, lean into the bias. Lean into the fact that this is a biased perspective. This is something I haven't done with my own setting document. I want to be clear and transparent about this, but it is something I would like to do moving forward. Um, so when I assert, let's say, if I say something like, the clans of Kirtal value freedom above all else, um, I can add something in there. I can put the challenge on myself to be like, uh, this is something that someone, uh, this is like a quote coming from a, a ruler of a clan. Uh, of Kirtal. This is something that he's been recorded as saying, you know. Um, other leaders of Kirtal might think differently, might have a different approach to conceptualizing their culture, you know. Um, and the perspective of a leader, uh, which is which is uh, Agan in uh, the Kyrian language, uh, the perspective of a leader is going to be different from the perspective of a, of a commoner, right? Uh, even like now, like someone who is a blue collar worker is going to have a blue collar worker who's white and queer is going to think differently about the state of America than a um, black American uh, Marine who's deployed overseas to Afghanistan, right? Like these, even like, we're, they're both American, you know, we're all American, but we have vastly different perspectives. And I think it's important to be upfront about which perspective is talking in your particular descriptions of countries um, and which perspectives could be missing and the perspective of the person who is uh, portraying the talking. So who, who's writing the text block, right? Is this like a traveling bard? Is this Volo? Is Volo walking around and, and capturing this? Is this, is this 
uh, Dalapathy, a slutty traveling bard who's he was capturing like knowledge of the various powers of Indake and his next like epic poem, you know, uh, these are interesting things to toy with and play with, um, you know, and I think just prioritizing the idea of subjectivity, even within your setting, is uh, a, a valid and important creative exercise. That being said, there does come a point where you do just have to make a statement of near fact, like, there's desert in this part of the world. And I think, you know, desert geography, fairly non-racial, fairly non-troubled, you know, though I'm open to arguments that they are. Uh, those are probably some things, that's why I say first start off with like the, the touch, taste, smell, tangible aspects of the world before delving into the more subjective areas. Um, yeah, that, you know, and for the more subjective areas, try not to present them as objective fact, but more as common knowledge within that culture, perhaps. Um, or like common customs that can still be deviated from. Uh, okay, so question number three is from Lycan Dragon. Thank you. I think you followed earlier, right? Thank you. Um, how do you deal with world history? I'm trying to write my own and I have creative block. Oh my god. I feel, I feel you. Uh, it's so fucking hard to come up with like, uh, first of all, I empathize with your pain. It's hard. It's hard. Writing a history that doesn't already exist is difficult. Um, how do I deal with world history? <sighs> this is an evolving process for me. Here's the advice I used to give. The advice I used to give is I write, I, st I start with where the campaign ends and I write backwards. Uh, I can't use any of my campaigns. I can't use Transplaner as an example because it'll spoil it. Uh, and I can't even use my past campaigns as an example because I think my players of the cat past campaign are in the chat and are listening to me. So I can't fucking use that. Uh, so I'm just gonna be, I'm gonna try to be as vague and as specific as I can. Uh, for example, if I know that a campaign will end with a cataclysmic clash, you know, between eldritch, horrific eldritch beings, you know, and the native inhabitants of the material plane, then I think back to, is this the first time that these eldritch beings have contacted the earth, the earth here, uh, or have they made contact before? And if they have, what are clues of their contact that I can scatter throughout the world and that particularly insightful and engaged players can pick up on? Um, which you're, you'll notice that I'm answering not in terms of history, again, but in terms of the story that you want to tell in the present and in terms of the folklore. And that's what I beseech you to do as well. Not only is writing a history timeline, you sit down and you're like, okay, zero. The Big Bang occurs. I've fucking done that before. I've fucking written a world history starting from zero, the Big Bang. And let me tell you, was, I ended up using none of it. I didn't use any of the details I put into the history. It didn't help me at all. It didn't help me at all when I was running sessions. I'd be like, okay, I know that the world was created from a Big Bang and there were these like feuding outer gods that are now scattered across the universe. It doesn't fucking matter. My players never interacted with it. It doesn't matter for me too. It didn't help me run the game. It didn't help me inform my NPC's decisions. It didn't even help me build any like homebrew homebrew classes or like homebrew items or anything. Uh, I think I think writing a timeline can be a good place to jumpstart, to brainstorm, to get generate just like ideas about your world and generate ideas about how you want the campaign to end or uh, a direction you might want the campaign to go go toward. But I think I think it would be a, a better use of time to pour, you know, your creative energies instead of making a timeline into shared mythologies, right, that you can then trace back uh, you know, fuck it. I'll just I'll share some of this stuff right now because it's relevant. Um, I have in my GM notes uh, a working list of fables, right? Stories that people on Endake tell about their themselves and their histories. This is about like I think of creation myths, right? We share this as all all of humanity. Every culture has some kind of creation myth about something, you know. Um, thunderbolts, lightning. That's Zeus from the ancient Greeks, right? You know, like stuff like that. Um, I think the Milky Way in Chinese in Chinese God, okay, I'm gonna really expose my ignorance here. I have not read up on this at all very recently, but the Milky Way was created by, you know, a, a maiden spilling milk when she was trying to cross a river uh, to get to her lover, friend, I forget. If you know the myth, please correct me. Uh, in Chinese, you know, folklore, there are all different kinds of reasons that explain why the world is and how the world is 
today. And I, I encourage you to lean into that. How how was the god spine created, which is that uh, mountain range in, you know, in uh, Endake? That's folklore in my world. And that we'll talk about uh, later this week. Like, why, you know, like, why is there a volcano in Uhanahi? That's talked about. It's because, you know, of Mahu's anger or something. And these root, you know, the, the purpose of building a history, I think it's important to remember the purpose of building a history for your campaign. It isn't to flaunt how smart you are as a DM, even though it... <laughs> I like doing that. Uh, it isn't to, you know, be like, oh, I can think of interesting historical events that have never occurred before. Look at how creative I am. No, the purpose of building a world in the first place, and with that comes history, is to give your players a shared language with which they can talk about the world that is unique to your setting. It's to give your players a shared understanding of the world with which they can engage their characters. Uh, I hope that was somewhat useful. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't think so. Those are the only three I've seen. Um, more about uh, I think I think that's it. I don't see any other questions. Uh, uh, I'm gonna wrap things up now. You, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm sweating. I'm sweating from this lecture, which I think is a great sign. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna just like do a do a uh, sign off now. Thank you so fucking much to everyone who tuned in and listened. Everyone who was chatting. Everyone you know who followed. Thank you. Thank you. Air. Arborea? Arborea? Very cool name. Uh, thank you to everyone who engaged with the stream, had an open mind. Um, I'm Connie. I am GM Connie. I'm Connie Chong. I'm Professor Chong. Uh, I am DN Daddy Issues on Twitch and on Tumblr. My Twitch is empty right now and I probably will never develop it, but follow me on Tumblr. And I'm by Connie Chong on Twitter. Thank you. Our next uh, Professor Chong's lecture is tomorrow night at 5 p.m. Central. If you liked this, please tune in again. Um, and the, the special Andake Understood lecture series will go until Friday, 5 p.m. CDT, at which point the next thing to look forward to in Transplanar RPG's gamut of uh, series is episode three of our main campaign, which will be on Saturday, July 25th, 3 p.m. Central. And after that, Saturday, August 1st, 3 p.m. Central is going to be my official first Professor Chong's tabletop workshop where I actually give like solid advice that isn't just about world world stuff. But maybe you got something out of this too. Uh, stay safe, stay hydrated, stay thirsty, uh, speak truth to power, fuck white supremacy, fuck wizards of the coast, um, fuck racism, gay rights, uh, trans rights, and uh, peace out. I'm gonna go to a BRB screen, but don't be fooled, it's actually an end screen, I haven't built one yet. Love you guys. Goodbye.